Am I wrong for getting angry at my girlfriend, female 28, for hiding that she speaks Spanish? My family is from Mexico, but I was born in the U.S. I am the only one in my family who doesn't speak Spanish. All my extended family speak it, but I never really cared for it that much. Kat, my girlfriend, knows I'm Mexican and she asked if I spoke Spanish, but when I said no, she didn't push, which I found refreshing. Usually people ask a lot of questions. She never said she spoke Spanish, but I remember her watching something and hearing Spanish, but I figured she had subtitles on. If it's important, Kate is from Germany. Well, did you ask her if she speaks Spanish? She doesn't have to have to outright tell you, you have to ask her. Kat and I have been together for three months. Oh my god, you guys have been together for three months. Calm down, you want her whole life story? Relax. It's not long, but it's been intense. My grandma's birthday was on Saturday, and my family threw her a huge party. I invited Kat to come along with me as it would be perfect time to meet my family, and they're always very welcoming. Kat agreed. When we got there, everyone switched to English to speak to Kat, but they quickly went back to Spanish. I went to grab a beer and came back to find Kat talking to my aunt in Spanish. I came over and played it cool, telling her I didn't know she spoke it, yada yada. Sorry, wouldn't you be happy that your girlfriend can communicate with your family? Like... I don't see the problem here. When Kat was with me, she spoke English, but whenever she spoke to one of my family members alone, she switched because they switched. It made me uncomfortable, especially since it wasn't your typical barely spoken Spanish. It was full-on fluent Spanish, and she understood my fast-speaking relatives. I got really annoyed with her, but said nothing. My grandma told me how much she loved Kat and how she's happy I found such an amazing girl. All my family loved her and couldn't stop singing praises about her. I'm waiting to see what the problem is. I told her that I feel betrayed that she hid that she spoke Spanish and how she made a fool out of me there. I I admit I was shouting because I was so angry. I felt humiliated. Why is it her fault that you don't know Spanish? I'm trying to correlate the two, but they don't. They don't correlate. She asked me to calm down and told me that she never hit anything. I accused her of sneakily making her way into my family instead of having them warm up gradually. What? What a stupid thing to complain about. She asked if I was being serious and I confirmed. She called me a jerk and left my apartment. I was too angry to stop her. I am waiting for her to call me with apologies, but she hasn't been in touch since Saturday night. I told my brother about it and he told me that I am the fool, but I really disrespect the cat. So am I the asshole for getting angry at her? So many pick me, so little time. Am I the asshole for wearing sexy clothes around my roommate's boyfriend? I study in the city and I share an apartment with two other girls. I work at a bookstore and a cheese shop, all so I don't need loans. It leaves me exhausted when I get home. I usually take a shower, make dinner, and just go to my room. It was all fine until one of my roommate's boyfriends started hanging around with her almost every night. It didn't bother me at all until last Sunday morning when I was in the kitchen making coffee, the boyfriend came in and asked if he could have coffee and started chatting. The roommate later came in and she was visibly annoyed, so I asked her what's up and she said nothing. When her boyfriend left, she asked to talk to me. She told me that my breasts are very distracting and that maybe I should consider wearing a bra or a thick hoodie when I'm in the common area or simply just buy takeouts so I don't need anything to use in the kitchen every <laughs> evening when she, the other roommate, and their boyfriends are hanging out. The thing is that when I was making coffee that day, I was wearing a gray t-shirt and sweatpants. The boyfriend was in his boxers and she was wearing silk negligee. She's six feet tall and very beautiful. She has done some modeling. I'm 5'6", and while I'm happy with how I look, I never thought of myself as a threat to someone like her. So I laughed and asked her if she was serious. She became upset and told me that her boyfriend has been talking about my breasts. I was grossed out, so I just went to my room. All last week, I brought takeout with me and stayed in my room. No, come on. Yesterday, however, I came home at 6 p.m. They were already in the kitchen, the roommates and their boyfriends. Before I went in my room the roommate yelled pizza again soon you won't be able to go through the door i was fuming i put my sexiest push-up bra on hot pants and tiny see-through top i went to the kitchen and started making food the roommate was livid she started yelling and then stormed off to her bedroom while crying and calling me a whore My other roommate thought I was an asshole and heartless because the roommate has confided in us about her insecurities and eating disorder in the past that left her hating her body. Was I the asshole? Imagine sneaking out as a teenager to hang out with your best friends only to end up missing. Skylar Nees was a young 16-year-old honor student with a bright future. She had an active social life, loved to read, and like most teens, posted all about her life on social media. She had two close best friends named Sheila Eddy and Rachel Shove, who all attended University High School together near Morgantown, West Virginia. Nees and Eddy had known each other since they were 8 years old and had met Shove during their freshman year of high school. 
This trio was inseparable and Nice was initially an emotional rock for the two girls since both their parents were divorced. Over time, it became clear that there was tension within the group when Nice tweeted things like, you're a two-faced bean, obviously effing stupid if you thought that I wouldn't find out, and too bad my friends are having lives without me. It appeared that Eddie and Shove were becoming closer friends and leaving Nice out and a lot of fighting was going on between them as time passed. On July 6, 2012, grainy security camera footage from Nice's family apartment showed her getting into a sedan. The following morning, she didn't report for work which was odd because she had never missed a day before that. The nieces knew their daughter didn't run away because all of her things were still in her room. This is when they reported her missing. Later that day, Sheila Eddie calls Nisa's mom and tells her that she snuck out last night to hang out with her and Shove, but later dropped Nisa off at the end of the road as she didn't want to wake her parents up when sneaking back in. However, the security camera footage and times given by the girls aren't adding up. They stated to have picked her up at 11pm and dropped her off before midnight. Camera footage shows her being picked up at 12.30 in the morning and never being seen again. After doing some research about the girls' social media posts, investigators had a feeling that something was off about their story. A trooper named Chris Berry, who was assigned to the case in August 2012, decided to make a fake online persona as an attractive teenage boy who had attended their high school. This way, they could add the girls and watch their postings for any hints or clues as to what happened. Even though they found a few odd things, they still didn't have enough to charge them. What they needed was a confession to close the case. Little did they know that a few months later, things would take a turn in their favor. On July 6, 2012, a young 16-year-old girl named Skylar Nee snuck out of her house to hang out with her two best friends, Sheila Eddie and Rachel Shove. Grainy security camera footage from her apartment shows her entering her friend's car at 12.30 in the morning. This was the last time that she was ever seen alive. Police investigating the case strongly believe that all the evidence is pointing to her two best friends and are gunning for a confession. On December 28, 2012, a frantic parent calls 911. The caller was Patricia Shove, who said that she had an issue with her 16-year-old daughter. She claimed she couldn't control her as she was hitting them, screaming, and running through the neighborhood. When Shove was taken in for questioning this time, she blurted out that she and Eddie had stabbed Nice. It turns out that she and Eddie had planned to murder Skylar Nice a month in advance. One day, they were in science class and agreed that maybe they should kill her. On the night of the murder, Shove grabbed a shovel from her dad's house and Eddie took two knives from her mom's kitchen. They also took cleaning supplies and a change of clothes. When Skylar was picked up, she thought the tree were going to drive around and get high. The girls bought their own pipes and their knives. They drove near the woods near Pennsylvania for a perfect smoke spot and while Nice's back was turned, both Shove and Eddie pounced and started attacking her. Shove stated that at one point, Nice got away but they stabbed her in the knee so she couldn't run very far again and her fate was sealed. In her dying breath, she repeatedly said, why? Confused as to why her two closest friends would do this to her. When authorities asked the same question, Shove simply replied, we didn't like her. In January 2013, Shove took investigators to the woods where her and Eddie killed Nice. They initially couldn't find the body, but a week later, she was found, but the body was nearly unidentifiable. It wasn't until March 2013 that the crime lab officially confirmed it was Nice. Eddie was charged with first-degree murder and pled guilty in January 2014. She got a life sentence with possibility of parole after 15 years. Shove, guilty of second-degree murder, got a 30-year sentence. Skylar's family believes that the girls deserve no leniency from the courts and deserve to be locked up like the animals that they are. Here's a story time about when I broke off my one-and-a-half-year engagement with my fiancé. Ex-fiancé. We met on a movie set, he was playing my boyfriend, and within a week, we were already calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend. Two months into the relationship, he convinced me to move to LA with him because we both wanted to pursue acting seriously, and he was an established model already. He had worked in Tokyo and Paris as a model. Of course, I was so in love, I said yes, and I left my family, which was really heartbreaking for them. I will totally always regret that decision because I left way too soon. I was so young. We struggled for money in LA, but I decided to get a serving job, so I was making more money than he was because he was working at a movie theater making $8 an hour. Because of this, I had to pay for a lot of the bills, and I even started helping him pay off his school loans. We also shared a banking account, which was terrible because I was putting in way more money than he was. I hated the apartment we lived in because I would wake up with roaches in my hair, so I decided to get a second serving job. When I asked him to get a second job as well, he said no because he was very happy at his job. So I asked my fiance if he could get a second job to help me out with the bills, and he said no. I would tell my mom and sisters about the situation, and they would tell me that he should definitely be helping me out more, and I just would make up excuses for him, and I just thought, it's okay, he can work at the movie theater, and I will work my two jobs. At this point, I was paying for most of the rent, most of the bills, and his student school loans. I owed $20,000 you guys and I was paying for all of that. I even got a third job because I wanted to save up to move out of that crappy apartment. Finally I got hired at the strip club as a cocktail waitress and I was able to quit all of my other jobs. My ex-fiance was definitely happy with the amount of money I was making at the strip club. Of course he felt absolutely no pressure to get a new job and help me out. I finally put my foot down and told him we were moving to a better apartment because I was not happy in the apartment we were in. I told him he had no right to say no because I was the one paying for everything. We found the perfect apartment and I loved it. It was absolutely beautiful and I felt so at home there. Then one night, I was sexually assaulted at the strip club. Of course, I was really affected by it. At first, he was supportive, but after a few days, he basically told me to get over it. 
When he told me to just get over the sexual assault that I experienced at the strip club, I was shocked. I couldn't believe that the man I was about to marry would be so insensitive. And then I just started realizing, wait, I am paying for everything. I pay for your bills, I pay for your rent, I pay for your student loans, and you're here telling me to just get over this sexual assault. It was like someone had put a mirror to my face and was showing me the truth. The final straw was when I told him I wanted to quit the strip club because I didn't want to be in that environment and I didn't want to see the man that had sexually assaulted me again. He said, absolutely not, you can't quit, the money is too good. And that's when I broke up with him. I told him that I couldn't be with someone who didn't care enough about me and only really cared about the money and to be kept. He was so comfortable with me paying for everything and him just chilling at a job where he got paid eight dollars an hour while i was busting my butt every single night he told me i would never find anyone better than him the breakup was amicable thank god he didn't stress me out or anything he kind of said you know you'll be back of course i never went back know your worth and be with someone who actually cares about you ugh ugh weird title already am i wrong for not agreeing to let my husband have a baby with another woman Man, duh, of course, like what? Why would, the, why would, why would, why, why, why? I, 32 female, am married to a great man, James, 36. He might not be so great if he's trying to get another girl pregnant, but let's get into it. Who is a sperm donor to his friend, Miranda, 35 female, and her wife, Vivian, 30 female. And they have a sweet little boy, and he is a very involved uncle. This all started before I was in the picture, and when I first started dating James, it felt a little weird at times, but grew to accept it because not all families are the same. Also, Miranda and Vivian are great. James and I have been married for a while and trying for a baby because of the pandemic we decided to not actively try again until next year but are still not using protection recently miranda approached james about being a donor again he said that he needed to think about it and consulted me and to be honest i told him i was uncomfortable about the idea like i said miranda and vivian's son was already in the picture before i came around so i know i needed to accept it or leave but now that i am his wife and trying to conceive myself i just don't think that i can ever handle seeing another woman carry his baby a very valid point i agree with you james understood my stance and suggested Miranda and Vivian find another donor or adopt. They refused, saying that they wanted their son to have a sibling that was related to him, and this time Vivian wanted to experience giving birth. This is... I gotta pick my words carefully. This is kind of weird. James still refused, saying that he couldn't do it again. He tried to take all the blame, but I guess they were able to put two and two together and started asking me why I was so against them having a bigger family. I explained my reasons, and they said that I was being unreasonable and how my lack of pregnancy wasn't their fault. I mean, you didn't really make your case even better here. Like, this would make me want to say no even more, but go on. Since then, Miranda and Vivian have restricted access to their son, and I know that it's starting to take a toll on James and his family. Because their son is, technically, the only grandchild. I know that my reasons are purely selfish, but am I really in the wrong here? Okay, I take back what I said about your husband. He's a good man. He respected your wishes, and he said no. Vivian and Miranda need an attitude check. They should be appreciative that he gave it to them the first time. Now they want to switch out who wants to get pregnant. Not his problem. I officially don't get Gen Z. Thought I did, I'm on the apps, but last night, this generation blew my mind. I was working the Machine Gun Kelly concert, which is already a trip if you're my age and grew up in the 90s and 2000s because everybody was dressed like it was the 90s and 2000s. And it's one of those things where you're like, I didn't know this would come back. Like black and pink, chunky emo bracelets, hot topic attire, like the shit I'd wear every year at Wakestock. So anyway, I'm at my bar, I'm carting everybody. So in the corner of my eye, I see these two guys in line and I'm like, Oh. I'm gonna try and explain to you what these guys were wearing. Okay, so do you know the band Devo? <laughs> we're wearing completely matching outfits with matching hats and then sunglasses like this. It's like 80s new wave robot. It, it, they looked like they would speak in unison and they are matching head to toe, okay? So I card them because I'm like, you're either 12 or you just got in a time machine and you guys are like 50 years old. Again, I don't get Gen Z. Anyway, they both just turned 19, okay? So they come to my bar a few times and then the last time they come to my bar, the guy goes, I really like you. Like, how old are you? I was like, oh, I'm 30. He goes, can I like get your number or something? I'd love to take you out. Didn't even blink in my day. Do you think any teenager would even come close to asking out a 30 year old? Like he didn't even think, I don't think anything went through his head when I told him I was 30. I think he was just like 30. Don't care. We are Gen Z. We are not ageist. And I'm like, oh no, I have a boyfriend, but it's really cool that you ask. I wanted to say like, good for you for being confident. He didn't care. He was like, no problem. Have a great night. And I was like, what the hell? Got home, I said to my boyfriend, guess who asked me out? And he's like, who? And I'm like, a kid dressed like Devo. <laughs> anyway, these, these kids are wild. So my wife called me on her way to the grocery store and said, hey, you should go up the street. I think there's a Lamborghini there. It could be a kit car. I'm not sure, but go check it out. I was like, all right, got nothing to do. So grab myself a cold beer and sauntered up the street. I could tell from about 100 feet away it was a kit car, and a really bad kit car. So I noticed the uh, the lights were on. So I walked up the driveway and said, excuse me, don't mean to bother you, but I think your lights are on on that white um, kit car. 
And the owner, incensed that I had outed him in front of his friend, said, it's not a kit car. Okay. So we walk back. He turns his lights off. I said, well, if it's not a kit car, what is it? He goes, it's a Corvette. Like, really? With the engine in the rear? He goes, well, you're being a smart aleck, so I'm going to be too. I'm like, not really, man. What is it? He says, it's a 1986 Lamborghini Countach 5000 QV. I was like, with a V12? Yeah. All right, let's see it. He goes, do you have enough money? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, show me your money. Like, now, I realize my deep V undershirt and my muffler man koozie was probably not a good indication of, of proof of wealth for him to show me his V12. But I was just so taken aback by his douchebaggeriness that I had no good witty response. So he said, no, you're not seeing the engine. I was like, okay. And uh, so I'm looking around it and two ladies come out to ask him about his 40 foot sea ray. I was like, yeah, I wonder if that's real. He starts pulling them away, like up the driveway to get them away from me as if I'm diseased or, you know, doesn't want meddling with the hoi polloi. So I walked home and uh, was thinking all the way home of all the great comebacks I could have had. And I thought of the best one. I'm gonna run to the shop and get this real Lamborghini Urocco, pull up to the driveway, walk up and just say, excuse me, uh, maybe you'd like to see what a real Lamborghini looks like. I was so ready for the ownage, but alas, when I drove by, he was already gone. Lawyers of Reddit, what's the most ridiculous argument you've heard in court? I'm a lawyer. The most ridiculous argument I've seen was one I actually made. One of my clients got busted cooking crystals. This was a very clear cut case. They actually caught him in the middle of a cook. No way he was getting out of this one. Even worse, he was cooking at home and children were there. Yep, the DA loaded him up with felonies. There was no bail and he was being held in the county jail. My client knew he was screwed. He had been planning to get married a few weeks after he got busted. My client asks me if he can get released for 24 hours so he can still get married. I tell him that I'll ask, but that there's no way in hell they'll let him out. First, I ask the DA if they will allow it. Nope, they laugh. So I file a motion with the court. Now, I knew the judge was a crusty old conservative family values kind of guy, who also has big thing for drug crime. There was no law involved, but I put together an argument about the sanctity of marriage and how the state should encourage marriage at all times, and that sort of thing. We have a hearing and I make the argument. The DA is totally opposed and calls it ridiculous. And the judge grants it. The judge actually decided to allow my client out for 24 hours to get married. He had to surrender at the county jail at 8 a.m. the next day in some other conditions, but, still, he was allowed out. Everyone is stunned. Nobody can believe it. The day of the wedding comes, my client gets out, gets married, then goes back to the jail. Everything went exactly like how it was supposed to, which is also pretty shocking.